Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you and thank you for coming to this Credit Safe webinar. Um, looking forward to getting started and jumping right in here in just a moment. But first, I want to give you a little bit of information to start out the, uh, the webinar. We want you to be able to interact with our speakers and with this topic. We want you to be able to um, have, take part in all of this. So the way that you do that is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little text bubble that says Q&A. Please throughout, and I do mean throughout, as we're going through this presentation and, and talking about this topic, make sure to ask any questions that you have that are uh, on point for what we're talking about or relevant to what's going on. Um, if it's a more of a generalized question, we may just let you know that we're going to hold it till the end, but most likely we're going to answer it right at that time. Uh, but again, want to welcome you now that you have, have that background and uh, let you know my name is Nathan Kalb. Uh, I handle brand engagement for Credit Safe USA. And uh, I am fortunate to be able to host on a weekly basis uh, these awesome webinars talking to uh, business professionals, um, folks that are top in their field uh, each and every week. So it's, a, it's an honor for me to be able to do this, an honor to uh, be able to host this each and every week. Today, um, we have a, an interesting topic as, as different states are doing uh, different levels of reopening the businesses and allowing for different uh, things to happen. Um, we have some folks talking about the legal considerations uh, that are uh, needing to be taken care of uh, and what do you need to know as you go forward in your business. Uh, so Yendalela Holston uh, and Gunjan Talati, thank you guys so much for coming and being a part of this. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Um, great to be here and appreciate uh, Credit Safe having us on. Absolutely, it's our so pleasure. And uh, yeah, I'm going to let you guys kind of do an introduction on each of you uh, and kind of let us know what's going on today. But I just wanted to say that and I'll be uh, going on throughout this, folks, just uh, if you hear me break in, it's with questions or something like that. But we're pretty much going to let these uh, these experts uh, take the, take it away. Great. Thank you, Nathan. And uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Or good evening uh, to the folks that are joining today. I'm Gunjan Talati, and I'm a partner at Kilpatrick Townsend, and I practice in the Government Contracts and Export Controls Group. And so my practice is at its core a regulatory practice. And with me today is Yandalela Holston, who is Kilpatrick Townsend's Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, and she's also a, a one of our esteemed labor and employment attorneys. So between the two of us, we've covered a number of different areas a number of different challenges that companies have faced involving COVID-19. So we're happy to be on here today. We're happy to have a discussion with, with you all and um, address some of the issues that we're seeing as companies open up. Um, so with that, Yandalela, uh, would you mind telling the audience what we're covering here today? Sure. And uh, Nathan Gunjan, if you could give me a thumbs up, if you can hear me or if it's spotty, I know. Things are a little spotty on my end, but I wanted to make sure. Awesome. So, guys, you know, navigating the decision as to when and how to reopen businesses is just as daunting, if not more so, than the decisions to close the businesses. Resuming business operations requires a lot of preparation, constant monitoring of directives from federal, state, and local government entities, regularly checking for updated guidance, um, and coordinating a whole host of laws and potential sources of liability. Um, in this webinar, Gunjan and I will attempt to address some of the most commonly asked questions that we've received regarding reopening. Um, this particular slide is a little tongue-in-cheek, but we thought it was a great way to start. Um, the point of it is that now we're all responsible for public health in a way that we never wanted or imagined. So, Gunjan, do you want to talk right. about the, the landscape? Yeah. Yeah, Yandalela, happy to. Um, so, what we've got here on, on this slide is assessing the applicable legislation and regulations. And, and really what this is getting to is everything is not the same across the United States. Um, so, what we want to talk about and lead with is what companies really need to consider as they move towards reopening from the perspective of what information do they have to make sure they're tracking and understand as they put together their reopening plans? And at its core, it's the reopening orders which uh, soften or retract some of the closure orders that we saw. 
Um, and the challenge with this is that the closure orders were not uniform across the United States. And in fact, they weren't even uniform within a, a given state. Because you had different authority at local, city, county, state levels, um, there really is this sort of puzzling framework uh, as to what the closure orders actually cover um, and, and then exactly what the reopening orders cover. Um, so it's important for companies to understand exactly what they've been subject to from a closure order perspective and what the reopening orders actually allow. Um, and, 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 and there may still be this sort of confusing framework where you have a city or a county government saying one thing and a state government saying another, and you gotta harmonize the, the, the multiple uh, orders or, or figure out which one controls if there's a conflict between the order. Um, so that's something that's extremely important for, for companies to get their hands around. It's even more so important if you're in a location uh, that covers multiple jurisdictions. And, and I'm thinking like a tri-state area, um, uh, like Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. Um, you, each of those are separate jurisdictions, and each of them have separate orders. Um, but it's, it's easy to see how you could have employees that work in the district uh, but live in Virginia uh, might have to figure out how to navigate those orders. So, so that's one piece of it. Um, the other piece of it is, is getting the hands around what the Centers for Disease and Control Prevention Guidelines are and what aspects of those they need to incorporate into their business. Um, that's going to be impacted by any additional requirements that state licensing boards may impose. So we see this in those types of businesses um, that, uh, uh, that where you have a licensing requirement. So medical licensing, um, medical facilities, uh, dental facilities. Um, we've even seen this for cosmetics types businesses where there is a licensing requirement for cosmetology or, or those sorts of professions. They might impose additional regulations or, or requirements in order to reopen beyond what other businesses might have to deal with. So just to give you an idea, uh, Nathan, of the, of the different framework uh, that, that companies have to work within. Right. And I, I mean, I feel like that brings up a good point. You've got so many different localities and, and uh, organizations and, and government agencies with all of these different guidelines and, and stuff. And, and some of them are a little bit more clear cut. They're more understandable. But at the, at the end of the day, businesses have to operate. They have to get out there and do business. So how do they how do they handle this from an operational perspective? Yeah. Um, so so from an operational perspective, and, and, and this goes back to to the, the, the joke that we had on one of the easy, uh, previous slides of good thing we all have public health degrees, right? <laughs> um, and and, and, and it's, it's only partly in jest because um, you do in some sense need to understand what the health requirements are um, and, and, and how you can mitigate risk for your business. So from an operational infrastructure, um, it's largely focused on implementing environmental changes to mitigate the risk that COVID-19 now presents to your businesses beyond the additional risk that you, you had uh, as a business. Um, so this could involve robust cleaning protocols, reconfiguring the layout of your store, um, requiring masks if you're dealing with a vulnerable population. Um, uh, and, and, and so there are operational considerations from when you open all the way through how you open to how you manage the flow of people within your, your facilities. Um, another operational best practice, if you will, is to designate a point of contact for COVID-19. Because we're seeing a situation where things change day to day, orders, closure orders, reopening orders mm -hmm. might change or be modified um, it's, it's best to have someone who, as part of their job description, will follow these regulation or these changes, um, will follow what's going on so that they can keep abreast and, 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 and make sure that the store or your facility is implementing the most up-to-date protocols that are being required. Um, and then you can't undercount or you can't um, underestimate the importance of communication to your employees and customers. You know, rumors tend to uh, thrive when there is yes. no communication from leadership. Um, so it, it, it is definitely important to make sure that you're communicating 
with your customers, your clients, but also your employees so they understand what the reopening plan is, um, what their options are if, if they're uh, in a vulnerable population. Um, and, and, and I know Yonda Lilo is going to talk a lot more about those sorts of issues, but from an operational perspective, think about strategically and practically what steps you need to take to be doing business with the public again. Right. And I mean, let, let's get into that. I mean, let's just call it what it is. It's probably the, you know, the, the 800 pound gorilla, the, the, the elephant in the room, whatever you want to, whatever way you want to say it is, is not just the, the public uh, and dealing with getting things to uh, your customers, but it's really about your staff, your, your, your people. Um, you know, you want to take care of them. You want them to be working. You want to be doing it. But how do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, so that's a great question, Nathan. A big part of making sure that you've made the environmental changes necessary to minimize the spread of COVID-19 will involve assessing and modifying staffing and business models. While COVID-19 has been ever-changing, first kids couldn't get it and now they can. First you need a fever to spread it, now you don't. Um, <laughs> originally it was just flu-like symptoms and now it's like a taste. There are two things that have been constant through this whole thing, and that is social distancing and hand washing. Well, most workplaces aren't set up for social dis distancing, so you need to figure out how to make that work. Um, this can be accomplished in many different ways, but most largely it's going to be through the staffing model changes. Um, and that can include returning employees to the workplace in waves, staggering employee schedules each day to limit the number of people present at any one time, you could um, allow only certain teams in on certain days so that if, for example, you get a confirmed case, you know exactly where to look versus having to uh, target or talk to a bunch of different people. Mm. Alternating weeks between employees working on site and are continuing to allow employees to telework where practicable. Um, enabling business teams to negotiate their own in-office versus remote work schedules are another way to do it. Um, you really need to look at what people do and determine how essential it is that they perform their job every day on site. So if it's a customer facing employee, unless they're a call center type employee, they're likely going to need to be in your facility. Whereas managerial employees may not need to be there every day. They can communicate with their direct reports remotely and come in occasionally. Inventory and stocking, you can stagger that so that that's done in the evening or um, in the early morning when there are not a lot of other people there. IT has been like the superheroes of all of this um, <laughs> yes. and setting us up to work remotely. And so they could probably continue to do that. Um, similar with marketing and sales, you're going to have to consider for each person or each type of job, do you really need to be here to do your job? Um, how, most people, most everyone agrees that it's safer at home. Thus, those employees who are told that they have to come back to work on site will likely not be happy. In addition, the people who can perform work remotely are likely your higher level employees. And so that could create morale problems and issues and claims that there are two tiers of employees. And I understand that and I'm sympathetic to it, but if a person can work at home, they probably should. Um, <laughs> in addition to morale, we understand there's also tons of demands on people when they're working at home. Um, luckily, you have not heard my six, almost seven-year-old come screaming, but I can't promise that will be the case this whole presentation. Um, and so other people working from home kind of have the same issues. And this and an overall lack of focus could also make you feel, our employers feel that their employees are less productive when working remotely and make them want to encourage people to come back into the office. Um, however, whenever someone is in your facility or in your establishment, there's a risk associated with that. And the best right. way to minimize that risk is to minimize the people at the establishment. Who sure. I am sorry, accidentally changed the slide. That's um, okay. you, you know, you just gave away the picture though. That's the, you know, it was a, it was a great oh, fun picture I there. Know. So, but we, I mean, we can, I know we, can how to see it. we can jump onto that. I mean, I, I, I feel you as, as somebody who, who works from home right now and, and who works from home generally with a 12, mm -hmm. 10 and eight year old, um, it can be, it can mm -hmm. be tough. And, 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 so there's some, some employees want to go back to work, you know, get me out of this house. Uh -huh. This is crazy. <laughs> others of us, you know, others of us want to be able to work in our, in our pajamas and be, be happy doing that. Um, but 
for those folks that do have to go in, whether they are seen as essential because we're reopening, we have to have you in facility, or you're mm -hmm. seen as uh, an essential person in office for whatever the, the reason is. And, there, and like you said, there's a multitude of those type of reasons. Is there something employers should be doing or could be doing to help protect those workers as they do come in? Um, I know you touched on it a little bit in the, when you were talking about that last mm -hmm. episode, but give me a little bit more on that. So under the Occupational Safety and Health Act, employers have a general duty to furnish their employees with employment and a place of employment that are free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to their employees. This duty continues to exist during COVID-19 pandemic. Early in the reopening process, the CDC and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is the organization that, impact, that enforces the Occupational Safety and Health Act, um, made strong suggestions about what employers should and should not do to protect their employees. Um, it's important to remain conscious of the limitations of the available guidance because on May 14th, the CDC issued high level decision trees for reopening of businesses. Um, these decision trees were criticized by many public health experts as insufficiently specific and overly permissive. In addition, the guidelines are less detailed than the extensive guidance that the CDC was originally considering releasing. So for this and other reasons, it's prudent for organizations to consider the most conservative public health guidance in, that's currently available. And some of that guidance would involve implementing the following, providing personal protective equipment for employees, which I'll be referring to as PPE. So um, where there is frequent and unavoidable contact with customers or even with other coworkers, you need to make sure that employees have masks and potentially depending on what they're interacting with, gloves. In addition, they should be cognizant of regularly removing gloves if they're wearing them because not doing so could spread COVID-19 just as if you were using your hands. Yes. Um, so you may wanna implement a schedule reminding people to change out their PPE if you provided a disposable mask or a disposable gloves. You wanna make sure that you're regularly cleaning the workspace, especially in high traffic areas, bathrooms, kitchens, break rooms. Um, you also should consider shutting down some of those high traffic areas. Bathrooms are essential, but maybe a kitchen or bake room, <laughs> um, break room, not so much. And you want to also wipe down regularly anything that would be touched, like a door handle or a bathroom door or anything like that, elevator buttons. You want to regularly clean and disinfect those and also sure. consider ways that you can make them no touch. Um, right such as automatic doors or prop the bathroom door open um, so that people don't have to touch it. Installing hand sanitation stations at designated entrances to the building and throughout the workplace. Um, removing high touch shared tools. I don't think many people think about these. Whiteboards and markers, remote controls, break room supplies, all those things people touch all of the time. And you wanna remove those and minimize their usage because those are breeding grounds for the spread of germs. Mm -hmm. Maintaining disinfectant supplies near or on each desk or work area, particularly those that are shared. And while I'm on it, let's not share. Um, sharing <laughs> is not sharing now. So let's not we gotta, share. We got to rethink preschool here, here is, is what you're telling me. I, I mean, we got to go all the way back to preschool and reteach. Re I know. We had to talk to the care bears. It's not caring. <laughs> um, and so... <laughs> You want to like you you don't want people to share and if there are areas where people have to like use the same computer you want to make sure there's a deep clean between them um, right. removing shared food and beverage items like the coffee machine I think you're gonna have to find some place else to get your caffeine fixed during the time period and then providing hand sanitizer disinfectant wipes and other such products that allow individuals to disinfect as necessary gotcha. um, after doing all that stuff you should also educate your employees on all the things you're doing to keep them safe. This will make them feel better about being in the workplace, which will also minimize morale issues and complaints. Um, okay. I'll discuss testing and the limitations on that later. Okay. But many agencies and states recommend that employers do symptom testing for employees. Sure. And so this would normally be a prohibited test under the Americans with Disabilities Act, but not in the age of COVID-19. However, when testing, you have to comply with the confidentiality requirements. You're going to make sure that the, the documentation is kept safer, that people don't know what happens, uh, what the results are. 
Okay. And then finally, part of maintaining a safe and healthy work environment is being flexible with your leave policies. Don't require me to have a positive COVID test. If I tell you I don't feel well and I have something, maybe let me stay at home. Now, again, you know people are tend to abuse systems, and so you do want to be cognizant of that. And I'm not saying give everybody leave. Um, but I am saying that you should probably take a flexible approach during this particular time sure. and maybe more flexible than you otherwise would. Sure. Well, and, and let's, let's talk about that. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a big deal right there it is what do we do if you find out through all of that, that somebody's sick? So this particular slide is intentionally more detailed because we wanted to make sure that everyone had what they needed in one place. So okay. if there's a confirmed case of COVID-19, you want to identify where and how employees might have been exposed at work and notify other employees of the confirmed case without revealing the infected employee's confidential medical information. Um, part of the way that you can do that is to assure that you have a confidential pathway for employee reporting. So as part of your operational infrastructure that Gunjan was talking about, you need to have a set plan that employees know that if you have symptoms, if you have a confirmed case, this is the person you tell. And that person needs to know, who do I then report out to? Do I report out to a manager? Do I report up? Do I reference the person's name? The answer is always no. Um, but you do need to figure out where they work, who they may have been in contact with, because you want to then notify those employees who would have been in the same area as the person who was confirmed that there was somebody who was a confirmed case, again, without um, letting them know the name. If the person is at work and gets their confirmed test, hopefully they're not because you've been very lenient in your leave policy. But if they are at work when they get the confirmed test, you want to immediately remove them um, from the establishment. And then you want to close off that area. Uh, I don't think any of the people on the call would have a business that houses people. But if you, so if you don't have a business that houses people, the CDC actually recommends that you don't clean for 24 hours. They want you to basically quarantine off the area, let 24 hours pass, but increase the ventilation, and then clean and disinfect. And they are very clear about cleaning being separate from disinfecting. So cleaning, soap and water, et cetera. And then using disinfectant to clean the work area. And so that's what you do when you have the confirmed case, but you also need to know how to transition a person back into the workforce. Um, what you're gonna require. Are you gonna require an all clear to return to work? Are you going to say, once you're confirmed, you don't come back here for 14 days? Like, you need to have a protocol in place so that people know how and when they come back to work. And you'll also need to remember the various other laws that apply. So the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which applies to employers with less than 500 people, and that um, and most with, and some that are under 50, because you can get an exemption. But you want to remember that that's going to require you to provide certain paid leaves and do certain things that OSHA says you have to clean and keep it safe, that GINA's Genetic Information and Discrimination Act and the Age Discrimination and Employment and the Americans with Disabilities Act both require you to keep the information confidential. And there's a host of state laws <laughs> that will also apply. So a lot of laws to consider if you, if you have that, but the, <laughs> the protocols probably call one of you guys at that point. <laughs> um, but, but, um, but the protocols need to be in place ahead of time and, and it's, it's kind of add to the, the guidelines that are there, but don't ever take away from if I'm, if I'm understanding yeah. you correctly. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, so great. We've, we've, we've got that covered. We kind of got that idea at least, at least touched on. I mean, I'm sure you could go probably three hours just mm -hmm. on this one topic, but if we, if we're in business, we have to have customers. We have to have somebody buying what we're doing whether it's a service, a, bit, uh, a product we're creating, wh whatever, how do we worry about them too? Uh, what do we do to keep them safe? Yeah, Nathan, that goes back to one of our earlier discussions, which is operationally, what do you need to do? And that's okay. mitigating risk. And so from the risk perspective with customers, it's creating a safe environment as, as, as much as practicable for your customers. So what does that entail? Well, you could have as one aspect of it uh, a post uh, of, of COVID-19 warnings. So it's alerting your customers. Here are the steps you've taken to mitigate the risk, but you can't eliminate it um, uh, the, unless you are in a CDC facility. I don't think anybody can, can claim you're, you're in a truly sterile and completely 
um, sealed off environment. Um, so, so it's important communicating that. Um, you may want to limit or stagger customers or visitors. If you are a business that lends itself to booking appointments, perhaps mm -hmm. you turn your operations into an appointment only that allow you enough time to make sure that you don't have people waiting uh, in a lobby area um, and, and, and that you know what the, the flow is going to be of, of customers or clients that day. You have time in between to clean the steps that Yandalela covered in terms of cleaning and, and, and disinfecting between um, uh, employees or, I'm sorry, between customers or clients that are visiting. Um, and, and we've got the cleaning and hygiene items that are listed there. And there's a few aspects of these uh, that we want to run through. Um, the high traffic areas are where you present the most vulnerabilities because that's mm -hmm. where the most people are coming in. Um, sure. and, and so you want to set up a process. Um, we've seen this done in a number of different ways. If you look at the supermarket videos um, that have been posted on the internet of, 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 of folks visiting supermarkets, you'll see that, that there is an employee standing outside uh, that's wiping down carts, um, mm -hmm. uh, checking folks for face masks for some uh, establishments that, that are requiring face masks for folks. Um, so, so that's one part of it. Um, sanitation stations throughout. Uh, another thing you can do is, is manage traffic flow. So you don't have bottleneck areas um, where a bunch of customers may all be in one spot at the same time, increasing uh, the risk uh, of an infected person potentially uh, transmitting the, the, the virus. Um, you can also look at redefining your customer service uh, approach. Um, going to a curbside delivery, offering that as an option, as, as some sure. retailers have done since this, since this all started. Um, and also a no-touch payment system where folks don't have to insert a card or hand a card to a cashier. Perhaps um, they can use uh, some sort of pay system that's wireless on right. their phones to the, um, uh, to the payment, uh, the point of sale system. But the important thing uh, about all this, uh, Nathan, is that there is no sort of one size fits all answer. Uh, businesses are going to have to take a look at the different risks for their particular business. And that's a sure. function of a number of different things, right? Um, the, 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 the person, the, the, the people and the clients that they work with, are they dealing with high risk population, um, uh, elderly folks or, or folks with um, uh, uh, compromised immune systems? That's a mm -hmm. different risk profile um, than, than maybe just um, uh, uh, the general population. Uh, but then you've also got to think about the layout of your store or your facilities. Does it lend itself? to these sorts of mitigation measures. Um, so you can't just think that, well, let me just find all these different checklists and, and, and thought leadership that folks have put out and, and I can just check the box on each of these items and I'll be okay. It's really got to be a, well, let me look at this thought leadership, analyze it in the context of what my business is, and then put together a plan that, that works for me. Um, that's where you're going to see the biggest benefit to, to your organization um, and, and that's where you're going to be able to effectively mitigate the, the risk that's out there. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, we can look around. There's, there's examples all over uh, of, of businesses doing that. I mean, I'll, I'll highlight one in my local area that does a specialty donuts. They started as a food truck and now they have an, an on, you know, an, an in-person brick and mortar location that they've closed uh, for the time being. They went back to the food truck, put a slide off of their food truck. So you can only use their app to buy everything. You order it from their app. Uh, when your number comes up, you walk up and they pop it out the slide, which is put on an anti antibacterial wipe and it slides down onto a table. You pick it up. And then once you pick it up, a person runs in and cleans the table and runs away. And it's quite something to see. I actually yeah. had to go order from them just to go see this process, but it works. <laughs> and it, it actually became a bit of a marketing yeah. thing for them. Um, but you know, we've seen that. We've seen, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a, I forget exactly which European country, but there was a, a country in Europe that had little, uh, almost greenhouses over the, uh, their cafe tables so that, you know, you had your own little bubble that could be disinfected inside of that every time. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen, you know, places where they, they gave you a little vest that was made out of cardboard that was thrown out each time that, you know, had three feet in front of you and three feet behind you so that nobody could get within six feet of you type thing. 
I, I, we've got all these things going on and I mean, we can get crazy with them, but you know, Yandalela, what, what can people legitimately do to, to work on that, that social distancing, whether it's a retail store, whether it's an office, whether it's a, a warehouse, whatever. I kind of started talking about this earlier. Like you remember, it used to be the two constants in life were death and taxes, not social distancing and sanitation. And so, <laughs> Wait, does that mean taxes are gone? Did I just hear that from a lawyer that I don't have to pay my taxes anymore? <laughs> At least not until July 15th. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but social distancing is now part of like everyday life for most Americans. Sure. Even in places where strict social distancing measures are not mandated, decreasing density in public spaces, um, actively managing personnel schedules and regulating office traffic patterns um, need to be considered. There are certain things that you can do. Um, Gunjan alluded to some of them about avoiding bottlenecks around pop popular areas and reconfiguring some premises. Um, you wanna reduce the number of access points to your building so that um, people, have to use monitor protected entry points, except in cases of emergency. So you can make sure that you're limiting the people coming in and out and also doing your testing and that's what we're going to do, which we can talk about later. Um, and you want to establish a protocol for how people will enter and exit while maintaining the social distance. It could be marking off areas, um, facing people out, establishing a directional traffic flow for walking around um, to eliminate people walking past each other installing signage through the building to direct people on the way that they should take the route they should take. Um, you want to install potentially floor markings and if necessary, if there's going to be customer facing our close proximity to, between people, plexiglass and other devices to divide um, individuals, space out high demand areas for cubicles, for example, you want to maybe if you can use every other cubicle. Um, so that people are not beside each other. You want to require visitors and vendors to be seen by appointment only in mm -hmm. order to, con again, control the number of individuals in your office space at any one time. Sure. And it's important, um, as Gunjan suggested earlier, that you're clearly communicating these protocols, both with signage and also directly to the vendors, the visitors, and the employees. Right. Um, limiting the number of occupants in a bathroom at any time. No, like it's kind of like a, you have to go back to having hall passes and limiting the number <laughs> of occupants in elevators. Um, but you want to, again, we're, we're rethinking, we're going back to um, middle school or elementary school, but you want to do all those things, um, maybe alternating, alternating, um, alternating elevator usage or offering access to stairs for people um, where previously I, I know a lot of buildings, the stairs are somewhere off in a corner, but now it's time for them to make their grand debut again and encourage usage of people in stairs. And then um, removing seating from lobbies, waiting areas, conference room, break rooms, anything that's a common area to discourage people from congregating. And um, temporary closing things, like if you have locker rooms or cafeterias, gyms, things of that nature, closing mm -hmm. them down so that people aren't currently using them. And Overall, just rearranging things and being cognizant of how many people can be in the space at one time and what can I do to discourage right. them from doing so. Right. Okay. And I mean, that all makes great sense, but there's, there's that lurking question out there um, that I, I think everybody's going to have on this. What about masks? What about mm -hmm. masks? Who wants to feel this one? Right. <laughs> so I'll do it. Like, okay. So, I never thought I would see the day that the use of PPE would be a political issue. But here we are. Um, the battle of the mask um, is taking place all over the country in retail establishments and workplaces. We've heard of increasing instances of people sneezing, spitting, coughing. There's even been two shootings. You can Google them. Over being um, required or asked to wear masks. Right. Um, but politics aside, various agencies and sources have confirmed that the ability to identify people who are sick, enforce their quarantine, and trace their contact, contacts are all key components of opening, reopening business safely. So failing to do that um, and have some form of PPE and testing puts you at risk. So the question shouldn't be whether you do it, but instead which screening protocol and our PPE you think will be necessary. 
And for whom? Employees, visitors, or both? So on April 23rd, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission took the position that companies may administer COVID-19 testing before allowing employees to enter the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, as previously stated, you still need to be cognizant of various um, confidentiality requirements that will apply, but employers should understand these rules and their rules regarding protection in order to, and should err in favor of, at the very minimum, requiring PPE of employees and also considering some form of testing. Um, when testing non-employees, businesses should also have consistent policies and practices that apply to all visitors and enforce them. Just having the policy and practice means nothing if people are allowed to break it. Um, and you should remain cognizant that the information obtained may need to remain private just like it does for employees. Sure. Um, businesses that decide to implement testing or screening should consider the incidence of false positives or false negatives associated mm -hmm. with whatever particular test they're going to use. For example, if you're utilizing temperature taking, you should remember that people transmitting COVID don't have to have a fever. And if you're using one of the COVID tests, you should note that a negative test doesn't mean that you won't acquire the virus again later. Um, so even when using COVID-19 tests, you should still require that all individuals allow access to the facility, observe your infection control practices, such as social distancing, regular hand washing, and other measures in order to prevent transmission. Um, businesses may want to consider having customers and visitors sign a disclaimer of liability or an acknowledgement of the risk as a condition of being granted access to the premises. And such a, such a disclaimer can be combined with an informed consent. And you can't waive, an employee can't waive his right to a free, uh, safe workplace. So it's pointless to have one for employees because it's un unenforceable. And I think it's actually riskier to have an employee sign it, but there's nothing stopping you from asking your customers to do it, saying, hey, it's not all the way safe in here, so enter at your own risk. All right. Um, wow. Okay. Let's, let's, uh, I, I, we could go down a road here and I think, I think I'll be better to kind of steer the conversation away from that at this point. Um, but I, I mean, I, I get where you're going and there's, there's a lot to consider there, but let's, let's look at some, some bigger, broader uh, business aspects here. Um, Guns, I'm going to jump back to you. How have you seen supply chains getting affected by this? Yeah, Nathan. And, and so, Supply chains is, is, is a lot like chaos theory, right? A butterfly flaps, it w flaps its wings and an earthquake occurs. That's sometimes what it feels like when you're dealing with supply chains. Um, and, and, and this is only um, uh, magnified or intensified the pro problem with supply chains here uh, because it really is sort of a situation where even though your customer base is here in the U.S., um, uh, your employees are all U.S. based uh, because there is a problem far away uh, that you don't get the products that you need to sell to your customers. Um, and, and so we're seeing a lot of challenges with the supply chain. I mean, supply chain management is a complex and, and tough enough endeavor in the best, under the best of the circumstances, and we're seeing a lot of issues. I, I mean, there's been news coverage about the food supply challenges that we're seeing crop up. Um, and, and so we're seeing this really across a number of different industries. And, and mm -hmm. there's, there's a few considerations companies should keep in mind as, as they navigate this. I mean, first is COVID-19 supplies. As you reopen, you can't take the mitigating steps that Yandalil and I have been talking about in terms of cleaning, PPE, um, whatever else uh, have you for disinfecting um, without actually having the tools and supplies to do that. Sure. Um, but now you've got the challenge of everybody looking to yes. get the same sort of supplies at right. the same time. Um, and, and if you thought it was hard getting toilet paper at the beginning of this, try getting gloves uh, uh, right. that, that you need. Um, uh, so so it's, it's, you've got to find the appropriate suppliers that, that, that can provide that, that uh, COVID-19 uh, equipment that you need. Um, so that's, that's right. sort of one aspect of it. Um, but then you've also got to think about, well, if you've been closed for a little bit of time, you may have some inventory built up, but once the floodgates are reopened and, and, and hopefully uh, you have the, the consumer interest that you had um, at, at levels that were approaching pre-closure, um, you're going to sell out of it right. pretty quickly. Um, at least that's, that's, that's in a perfect world. That's what's going to occur. Um, how quickly can you restock it? 
Um, now, what may have been uh, your ability to restock in a fairly short order, that may not be there anymore because your supplier um, may have had an outbreak at their plant and, and had to close their shutdown operations for a certain period of time. Um, so now you've got to go out and look for alternative suppliers or accept that you've got a longer lead time in terms of getting your supplies. So as you reopen, part of the, part of the um, issues to consider are what is your inventory level? How are you going to be able to replenish it? Do you need to revisit your agreements? Do you need to consider alternate suppliers? Um, if you have all of your uh, inventory coming in from one location, one supplier, you've got all your eggs in one basket. Maybe now's the time to look at diversifying, having a supplier um, come from uh, having one supplier in the United States, having another in Europe and another in Asia uh, to, to diversify that risk. And of course, there's a cost impact to that, right? Some suppliers, especially if they're abroad, may have a higher cost of, of goods sold because you're going to have now shipping charges that, that get added um, from bringing that in. But maybe at the end of the day, that helps you mitigate the risk of not having product ultimately that you can't sell. Um, so those are the, the sort of su supply chain considerations companies need to be uh, working through. Uh, as as they reopen, um, but this is also an opportunity to revisit the arrangements that that they have with their suppliers. Um, they, cash flow, I mean everybody, uh, cash flow is tight for everybody these days. Right. So so um, renegotiate terms. You know, go to your suppliers and say, look, uh, uh, our payment terms aren't going to work in this new environment. We need to negotiate longer or different payment terms. I mean, now's the time, and you've sort of got the opening to do that. Uh, particularly if, if if you are seeing a massive impact to cash flow or um, uh, uh, seeing uh, supply chain challenges. Um, right. So a lot of different p moving pieces uh, on sure. the supply chain front, but, but what you really want to take away is you've got to understand your supply chain. Um, you can't just sort of accept that, that it's, it's going to be business as usual where you're going to get right. what you needed from your previous suppliers. You really need to think about what the risk is for, for them shutting down. Um, and there are, of course, multiple suppliers that your suppliers have. So you may sure. need to sort of step through a few different permutations and assess that risk. And I will be absolutely remiss if I don't don't say this and interject this here. That's what Credit Safe is here for. Uh, you know, we're here to help you figure that out and look at those risk levels within those businesses and those suppliers and all of that. And um, you know, go to our website, join the Stay Safe program. You can get it complimentary for 30 days, and we'll help you out. Uh, it's something we're doing for every U.S. business out there, just to to help them with this exact thing. Uh, because we understand this is tough. We want businesses to open back up. All of us live here. We want, you know, we want things to reopen and to, to be able to do it right. And, and as at the same time, you know, uh, you guys and, and us here at Credit Safe and everything, we're, you know, brothers and sisters and parents and, and all of that. And we want to do this well. And we want to be able to do this in a way that uh, is safe and, and solid for all of us. But we want you to get back to your jobs and we want you to have that opportunity because I think all of us are ready for it. Um, there's, there's only so many, uh, you know, games you can play and things you can do inside and, and places you can go that are, are safe right now. Do you, we we want to get to that point where, where we want to, to be able to have that, those other freedoms. Um, so yeah, if you are a business owner, please, you know, my, my information's on this webinar, go ahead and reach out to me. I will, I will happily help you out with this, this part of it. Um, the other part I will leave to these guys, uh, because they are the experts, but on, on this side of it, we are, we are happy to help. And one other thing I will add here is, uh, relationships, build those relationships with your suppliers, with your customers, with your distributors, all those folks that are involved in this. Um, this is, if you don't already have good relationships, this is that time to build that relationship and say, hey, how can we help you? How can you help us? How can we do this together so that we can all stay in business? We can all keep working going forward. Um, and if you've watched any of our other webinars, you know that's, I'm just echoing what we've, what we've said a bunch of times before. Um, but getting back to, to you guys, the experts, uh, the lawyers here, um, let's, let's talk law. Like, is, are we going to have... Is, are we going to go into a, a world of lawsuits for the next 20 years off of this stuff? Or, you know, how, how are we going to do this? What do you see coming, coming down the pike here? Yeah, yeah, Nathan. I mean, look, 
we as a, as a society, we're a litigious society under the best of circumstances. <laughs> yes. Um, and, 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 and these are far from the best of circumstances. So there's going to be a lot of litigation. We're already starting to see it, it come about. Um, we're seeing litigation being filed against um, uh, you know, uh, healthcare providers that uh, operate nursing home facilities for failing to protect um, uh, their residents. We're seeing uh, lawsuits um, related to supply chain issues where folks can't fulfill their orders. Um, so, and we're not even talking yet about about the the, the plaintiff's bars lawsuits uh, that that are anticipated too. So we're going to see increased litigation. Um, over the next few years, I, and very well, maybe over the next 20 years, uh, with with um, depending on the complexity and 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 the backlog that gets put into the mm. uh, uh, into the courts. Um, but but it's definitely going to be over the next few years uh, once we're out of this. Is, is uh, so it's it, the the litigation risks are going to be there for some time. Um, okay. So really what you have to do as a business is determine where that risk is actually coming from. Um, are you worried about contract suits um, with your suppliers, with your customers that are not potentially may not be in a position to pay um, bankruptcy uh, restructuring issues? Um, that's all going to head to litigation uh, for, for companies that, that can't come to agreements. Um, so that's one piece of it. Um, then you've got to think about what defenses you have if you're going to be on the defendant's side of, of that lawsuit. Um, the law recognizes certain excuses for not performing. Um, one of those excuses is, is known as a force majeure, which means it's, it's an act of God, effectively, that, that kept you from being able to perform. Mm -hmm. um, now, Again, like with most most laws, it varies jurisdiction to jurisdiction on your ability to, <laughs> okay. to use that defense and what the elements are. Um, so it's it's again, there's no sort of one size fits all answer. You've really got to look at what law applies to your agreement or what law applies to the situation and then assess your ability to rely on those sorts of defenses. Um, those mm. defenses are not as sort of all encompassing as sometimes they, they can be portrayed um, in, in, in the news or, or in um, uh, conversation. Uh, so, so you've got to really drill a little bit deeper into what, what those sorts of defenses entail. Okay. But before we even get there, you've got to put, Folks on notice, if you're having contract issues, um, you may have an obligation to put people on notice, put your suppliers on notice, give them an opportunity to cure. Depends, again, on what your contract language is. Um, so you want to make sure you do what you need to do to preserve those rights um, uh, to, to sue later on down the road. So take a look at your agreements, figure out what those uh, necessary steps are ahead of time so you can go ahead and do that so you don't lose the ability to sue down the road. Um, additionally, you want to think about mitigating damages. Just because you've got the ability to sue um, uh, doesn't mean that, that you don't have to think about uh, how to mitigate your damages. Um, and lastly, there are um, uh, concepts uh, uh, known as uh, termination, termina strategic terminations, um, where you may deem it better to terminate a contract uh, rather than um, uh, continue performing at a loss. And there are collateral implications of that. For instance, you may have a hard time uh, getting a, another contract if your agreement was with a local jurisdiction, uh, like a, a local state or, or federal contract. So you may be effectively barred from getting future contracts as a result of that termination, even though there was a net benefit to you at the time to continue performing then. Um, so lots of, lots of litigation considerations. And, and, and the takeaway there is that really um, you want to start thinking about it now, assessing your risk now, sure. um, and taking whatever predecessor or necessary steps there are um, uh, to, to protect your interests. Uh, because it's very hard to do that once litigation starts. You really want your ducks in a row ahead of time. Okay. And I, I'm guessing that, you know, best case scenario, if, you, if you're if you concerned about this, you think this might be likely for your particular business or whatever, contact someone that is 
uh, specializes in your industry and in your area um, that can help. That's out right. With this. Okay. Um, That's right. And if you remember Nathan at the beginning of, of the presentation, I told you what type of law I did, what type of law Jan Delayla did. Right. Um, there are specialists in, in just about every area of the law that you can think of. Um, what's important for, for, for folks and companies to consider is, is that a lawyer that they can work with? Do they have the right um, experience with the issues sure. that are going to be uh, popping up in your case? Um, and, and again, no one lawyer can handle all situations. Right. Um, it's, it's just a matter of finding the right lawyer for the right issue. Sure. And sure. we'll do a plug here too, Nathan, like you did a plug that we do are it. a full service law firm. Um, yep. with, a, with a partners practicing in a variety of areas. So while Guns and I are partners in specific areas, we have other partners who practice in a variety of other areas in the law. And so yep. for the most part, if there's a legal issue that you have, there's probably someone in Kilpatrick who can handle it. There you go. And there's there. Uh, <laughs> I, I see you just popped it up on the screen. We've got the, all the contact information for folks here. I, I do want to take a couple of questions here. If there's a couple more, we do have a couple of minutes. If anybody has any others as I'm going through these. Um, but first off, and I'm going to ask you just to give me like the tiniest answer you can on these so we can get as many questions as possible, which I know you're both lawyers. So that might be a little difficult, but do what you can. Um, is there any difference between businesses um, looking to reopen that have or do not have a union. So if they have a, so, a organized workers, is it, is it, is there any difference between the two? Uh, there are some differences. So if you have a union, you will need to bargain that. Um, that being said, if you don't have a union, you still need to be aware that the National Labor Relations Act still applies. And so if employees are complaining about the terms and conditions of their employment, that is um, protected activity and complaining about the safety would be one of those things. In addition, this is a prime environment um, that's ripe for union organizing so that if you don't have one, you could. Um, and so you wanna make sure you keep the employees happy and uh, not disgruntled about being back at work. Is that okay. question for you? That was great. That was, yeah, I mean, that was straight on it. That was, that was awesome. I was like, oh no, we got a long question here, <laughs> but well done. Um, okay, so another one here. Um, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase this one. We, we, we talked about, uh, Yonda Layla, I think you mentioned there's some adjustments now with the ADA, um, a, a, how that's perceived and how that's being, being uh, enforced. Uh, Gunjan, I believe you talked about the, or you did talk about some of the, the fights on the horizon, so to speak, the, 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 the lawsuits and the possible uh, litigation issues there. But what, are there going to be possibly, you know, protections put in place, uh, liability protections for companies? I mean, do you see that coming as well, like kind of both sides to that coin? Yeah, um, and, and that is being fought over right now at a number of different levels, uh, Nathan. Um, uh, so so um, uh, political leaders are, are, are debating that issue as to what protection needs to be extended, how extensive that protection is. Um, we've seen in some states already start to implement it. North Carolina is one where they have started to implement um, uh, liability uh, immunity protections. Mm -hmm. um, again, it is not blanket immunity. So sure. um, folks should not think that, that, that the one, that the immunity will necessarily apply to them. And two, even if it does apply, that there are conditions that they need to satisfy because there are um, uh, when you're dealing with, with sort of immunity issues. Um, but, but yes, we are starting to see that come about. But I think that's going to be um, uh, something that's going to develop uh, more and more over the next few weeks and months as more and more places reopen. Okay. And the flip side of the immunity is the fact that certain states are starting to say that we're going to presume that there's a workers' comp coverage. So, um, for example, okay. California has said that if an essential employee gets COVID, that there's going to be a presumption that they received it at work. And so I assume that'll be battled out mm -hmm. just like it was in Illinois, um, where they ended up changing course, but that's something that employers should be aware of. Okay. And again, be, you know, look at your location specifically where you're, where you're doing business. It'll, it'll be different on each of those. Um, awesome. I think that covers all the questions that we have right now, which is taking us up towards time, which is great guys. Thank you so much for being a part of this. This has been extremely informative. Um, I really appreciate it and, and, and appreciate all, all of your, your effort on this and being here for the questions and the, uh, 
uh, my hosting ability and all of that. I, I thank you guys very much for that. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us, Nathan. Absolutely. And for you folks that are watching, if you missed something, you want to go back to something, um, two things. One, uh, this is recorded. We did record this and it will be available uh, within a couple of days, uh, available through the Credit Safe website. And we'll be sending out an email that'll give you information on how to access this. So you can go back and look at this at any point. But I also want to give um, both of you a chance to let folks know how to contact you specifically. So if they have a question for you, um, how would they contact each of you? Um, I am on LinkedIn. I can also be reached via email at yholston at kilpatricktownsend.com. Okay. All right, Nathan. I, I have the benefit, I think, of being the only Gungeon to talk the only Gungeon to Lottie that's an attorney. Um, so, uh, in fact, I have met another Gungeon to Lottie out there. That doesn't mean that there isn't, but, but, but so I'm pretty easy to find. So, um, sure. you can, uh, you can get a hold of me uh, through our firm's website, um, uh, and just search for me and I'll be there, but I'm also on LinkedIn. So if you search Gungeon to Lottie on LinkedIn, uh, I'll pop up. Um, uh, happy to connect. Uh, and answer any questions that you may think of after uh, after this webinar. So sure. thanks again, Nathan. Yeah, and we will make sure that both the company website and both of your LinkedIn's are linked to the uh, to your names and everything on the video uh, recording uh, on the landing page when we set that all up as we do for all of our webinars. Uh, for those of you that have joined us, thank you so much. We appreciate you being here uh, as you come in and out on these different ones. Um, just so you know, next Tuesday, we will be having another webinar on automated decision making, how the uh, Credit Safe platform can be used, integrated and set up to automate decision making uh, for your business, save manpower, save time, save effort, save mistakes. All of that we'll be talking to uh, Leighton Weston, who is one of our premier accounts guys that does specializes in this area. Um, and it's going to be one you don't want to miss if you want to move into that area. But again, thank you so much. Thank you, you guys and everybody else. Have a great day. Bye.